Good evening, everyone. My name is Keith Williams, and on behalf of the Lancaster Conservancy, welcome to Nature Hour. Lancaster Conservancy's mission is to provide wild and forested lands and clean waterways for our community forever. We protect the ancestral lands of the Susquehannock, the Conestoga, and Shanks Ferry people. And my hope is that we care for these lands as well as these Native peoples do. For 50 years, our organization has sought out natural places that are so precious and beautiful, they must be protected. Our stewardship team works to restore these special places by creating trails, removing invasives, and planting trees. These preserves are then open for you and I to use to hunt, hike, fish, and bird 365 days per year. Special places like Shanks Ferry, House Rock, Hellam Hills, Kelly's Run, Otter Creek, Climbers Run, Welsh Mountain, and many others are protected forever. We launched Nature Hour with the goal of bringing an assortment of local and regional experts directly to your home with presentations that help us better understand the Conservancy's work and the work of our community partners. The format for tonight's lecture will be a 40 to 45 minute presentation, followed by 15 to 20 minutes of questions and answers. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll include your question as part of the conversation. This is the third lecture of our 2023 winter season. Our next Nature Hour will be February 22nd on the State of Our Rivers with Freshwaters Illustrated Director Jeremy Monroe and Lower Susquehanna River Keeper Ted Evgenitis. You can learn more and pre-register for this lecture and many other events on our website, lancasterconservancy.org, under upcoming events. The Conservancy is blessed with incredible corporate support. And tonight we wanna to recognize our annual sponsors who include Clark Associates, Staffers of Kitzel Hill, Lakshwama, Electron Energy Corporation, Eurofins, Dart, Ratu, and Penn Stone. Nature Hour and many other activities within the Conservancy would not be possible without this generous support. And now I'd like to introduce tonight's Nature Hour, the Pennsylvania Outdoor Economy with Silas Chamberlain. Silas is the Vice President of Economic and Community Development at the York County Economic Alliance, a position in which he serves as Executive Director of the Redevelopment Authority of the County of York and oversees a variety of economic financing, business attraction, entrepreneurship, and workforce development initiatives through York County. Silas oversees implementation of the county's 10-year economic development plan, which is intentionally pivoted towards people-focused and place-based economic development. He founded and oversees the York County Trail Towns program, now active in seven different communities, and is leading the development of the $75 million Cadora Screenway, the largest green infrastructure project in the city of York's history. Also on behalf of the York County Commissioners, Silas leads Yoko Strong Recovery Task Force. Silas previously served as the CEO of Downtown Incorporated, Executive Director of the Schuylkill River Greenways National Heritage Area, and in regional leadership roles with the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources and the Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor. He's an adjunct professor of economics and urban revitalization at York College, serves on the executive committee of the PA Downtown Center, and is a governor's appointee to the DCNR's Conservation and, and Natural Resources Advisory Council. In 2016, Yale University Press published Silas's first book, On the Trail, A History of American Hiking. And we are grateful that Silas is also a board member for the Conservancy. Silas, thanks for sharing your Wednesday night and your knowledge with us tonight. Absolutely, thanks Keith for the introduction and thanks to the Conservancy for giving me some time to talk about something that I'm uh, personally and professionally very passionate about, which is the way in, in which our um, economic interests overlap with outdoor recreation, both in Pennsylvania uh, and in our region. And so as I move through my presentation this evening, I'm going to first try to frame for you what we mean by the outdoor economy and what Pennsylvania's outdoor economy consists of today. And I think you'll be impressed by the economic impact that outdoor recreation has in Pennsylvania. Then I wanna talk about how uh, people like myself that care about economic development and business growth have come to view this paradigm shift that actually allows us to do our work better and in more meaningful and powerful ways because we embrace outdoor amenities, quality of life and outdoor recreation. And then hopefully to um, help round it out, I'll talk about two things that we're doing in York County, since that's where I spend my time, uh, that we think are embracing the outdoor economy and trying to leverage some of the insights that uh, we hope to see on a statewide level in the coming years. So just to give you a little background, because every time I talk to a new audience uh, about 
the outdoor economy and I start talking about outdoor recreation and trails and open space, sometimes the people in the audience who are mostly economic development professionals or business leaders start to tune out, unfortunately. Um, and they start to say, okay, well, he's a trail and park guy. So I like to just throw out some credentials from our organization. We are um, over a century old. We are York County's Chamber of Commerce and Economic Development Corporation. We do everything from uh, finance very large projects to attract attracting large businesses to York County, workforce development, um, and we oversee our industrial development authority, land bank authority, redevelopment authority, and we do very, very large projects like redevelop the Yorktown Hotel, which just reopened in downtown York, which was a $54 million project, to doing bond financing for Wellspan Health and our other health networks, to uh, giving out direct grants and loans to businesses. So we are very much a traditional economic development organization, and we do all those things, but we really see that the outdoor economy, outdoor recreation, and a focus of on quality of place helps us do our job and fulfill our mandate uh, as well as we can. So first, I'm going to start on a statewide level and just remind you that Pennsylvania's outdoor economy, if we look at it like we do other parts of our economy, uh, the infrastructure is there. And that's one of the reasons why this is such an exciting opportunity. Uh, we have 4 million acres of public land. We have um, close to 90,000 miles of rivers, creeks, and streams. We have more trails than any other state in the nation, um, including our very robust uh, rail trail network that you know, connects uh, communities to one another, uh, but obviously some world-class hiking as well. We are also blessed with local parks that municipalities and counties care for that constitute around 200,000 acres. And then we have all those sort of secondary outdoor recreation things that you, know, you don't always think about golf courses, ski resorts, snowmobile trails, ATV trails, and all those are growing assets as well. So Pennsylvania has this really remarkable infrastructure and we sometimes take it for granted, but when it relates to the outdoor economy, uh, it's really important. And the cool thing about all these assets that you know very well as folks who use trails and uh, the, the uh, conservancies preserves and other parks, uh, this is a use that has grown significantly during the pandemic. Uh, across all state parks and forests, there was about a 30% increase in use. Uh, and then some trails, uh, including the Heritage Rail Trail in York County, saw more than a 200% increase in use um, year to date in the midst of the pandemic. So when our economy was suffering, when we were dealing with a global pandemic, people turned to these outdoor assets. And as a result of that, as a result of this great infrastructure that we have and the interest in these outdoor places, there's this very robust economic sector that um, emerges around it. So in Pennsylvania, our outdoor economy generates $29 billion of overall economic impact. And at the core of that impact is sort of this core outdoor recreation economy, businesses that directly engage uh, with outdoor recreation. And I'll show you in a second, that could range from manufacturers that are making outdoor products to bicycle shops, to outfitters, um, to uh, program or people that work on state parks or state forests or the folks that work for Lancaster Conservancy are all part of that core economy that contributes $13.6 billion or almost 2% of our state's GDP. Um, just for reference, that's about a 15% increase in the last six years. So this is a part of our economy that's growing rapidly. And a part of that was due to the pandemic and all the um, interest that we saw. This is also a sector of our economy that isn't just one or two very large businesses. It's close to 8,000 businesses all across the Commonwealth, all playing different roles in supporting the outdoor economy, a quarter million jobs and significant uh, salary and wages, significant revenue. And, you know, just to make a basic comparison, visitation to Pennsylvania's state parks and forests alone generates $400 million in consumer spending every year. So when somebody comes to a campground or they go to a state forest to hike, they are spending money either at that site or they're going to nearby communities and nearby businesses and they're spending their money. 
Um, that is three times the economic value that's derived from the sale of natural resources on those same lands. And that includes oil and gas. And that's not to say that, you know, there aren't parts of our state where resource extraction is appropriate, but it is to say that when we look at the value that's coming out of our state uh, parks and forests, the primary value is visitation. It is not these other economic uses that sometimes uh, jeopardize that visitation. So very robust part of our economy. And even when you look, or I think it's interesting to look uh, on the left at that 1.6% of our GDP, that is outdoor recreation, the chart on the right shows what um, is what makes up that 1.6%. And you can see it ranges from retail trade. So your bike shops, um, maybe your uh, coffee shop located right next to a trail um, as being a very significant sector, but it includes all these other sectors that also play a role. And notably, manufacturing is one of the major sectors within the outdoor economy where people are actually making snowboards, bicycles, um, RVs, different types of uh, food, that all these things that help people do the outdoor recreation activities. And then, of course, accommodations and food services straight down through. But you can see this is not just one type of economic contribution. It's a very diverse part of our economy. And I note that manufacturing one, uh, because that has actually grown, I think, a about 20% in the last five years. So we have managed to build either through people founding businesses or attracting businesses to uh, Pennsylvania, uh, manufacturers that make these outdoor goods. So to just look at this a different way and maybe make it a little more um, tangible for us here in uh, York and Lancaster counties, you can see on the left, you know, this sort of private sector piece of um, the outdoor economy, the nonprofits, so that would be the Lancaster Conservancies of the world, your trail organizations, uh, your advocacy organizations, the public sector, so all your municipal parks, um, state government, county government, um, economic development organizations like mine that are sort of quasi-governmental. But I think the part that's um, exciting is when you start to see the private sector embracing outdoor recreation. And so whether you're talking about Shanks Mare, you know, an outfitter on the Susquehanna River, uh, some of our uh, bait shops and hunting shops that cater to sportsmen, our marinas that make the Susquehanna River more, um, more um, accessible, or uh, this image is from uh, Dutchware, the uh, backpacking hammock manufacturer that's located in Lancaster County. So there's a lot of different people, even here locally, that are part of this outdoor economy, whether they know that they're part of that bigger economy or not. Um, and then, you know, we are, again, we're not just talking about retailers um, and, you know, sort of hospitality uses. This is just one Lancaster County example. Quality Bicycle Products has a a uh, large warehouse located, I believe, close to maybe just east of Centerville um, that distributes very significant and well-known outdoor brands, Osprey, Shimano, um, and other bicycle brands and parts and equipment. So right here in Lancaster County is a major piece of the supply chain around the national outdoor economy, um, and they have a great facility there. So um, there's definitely the tangible economic impact of just having those businesses. But one of the things that's most fascinating is that the economic impact goes uh, much further than that. And in the 21st century, as different regions and states and counties compete against each other to try to attract new businesses, and perhaps even more importantly, attract people to live there or when they graduate to stay there, um, the outdoor economy or the outdoor amenities that a community has are a really important part of that competition. The communities who have trails and parks and open space and accessible waterways and clean, uh, high environmental quality will be attractive for people to live and work. And those that don't have them simply won't be competitive. Uh, and we know this because consistently access to bikes and walking paths and other outdoor amenities ranks in the top three considerations when people are choosing where to live. And we also know that as a result, uh, property that's located near to preserve land or parks or trails uh, is, has a significantly higher value than um, 
than property that's not. We also know that this cuts across demographics and political persuasion. So the chart on right shows all the different generations. Um, and you can see that the extremely important answer to how important is access to high quality parks and outdoor amenities uh, when you're choosing where to live is a big chunk. And even up to um, you know, 80 to 90% across every generation say that it's at least somewhat important to choosing where they live. So when someone is deciding as a, either as a young person or where they want to retire or sort of mid-career, what kind of job they want, increasingly they're um, looking at the quality of place when they make that decision. That's especially true of recent college graduates who are, you know, roughly 50% say that uh, place is even more important than job when they're choosing where to live. So that's why places like Boulder, Colorado are so attractive. They have a high quality of uh, quality of place. They have access to the outdoors and people move there and then find a job um, so that they can live there. The recent change in this is also with um, remote work and hybrid work so that people can really work from anywhere they can get a wireless or a broadband signal. Um, and then they can choose to live at places that have quite high quality of life. And so this idea of talent moving uh, and workforce moving to places with high quality of place is a really important dynamic that just really wasn't a factor even as recently as 10 years ago, uh, but now is really important. And I also like to say this is not just, uh, you know, trail people saying this or park people saying this or out open space advocates. Even when you survey corporate executives who are those charged with doing site selection. So when they're expanding the footprint of their business and trying to decide, well, am I going to go to Ohio? Am I going to go to Lancaster County? Am I going to go to Buffalo, New York? They say that quality of life amenities such as trails and parks are very important to site selection. And in some cases, it's on par with being close to a highway, the tax structure, um, energy costs, the, the price of labor. And so even corporate executives and site selectors who are very pragmatic um, are looking for these kinds of amenities when they're deciding where to grow their business. The Brookings Institute has done some uh, fancy looking charts that I'm gonna boil down for you in simple language. Um, and this is pretty much to say that quality of life, um, places that have high quality of life and a big metric for that is, is there access to open space and parks and recreation? See a positive correlation with population growth and employment growth, even more so than those that have a quality of business environment that is very high which means for a business that's low taxes, low energy costs, low labor force uh, costs, that is less important in population growth and employment growth than quality of, of life. And that's just, that's what I mean by a paradigm shift. It's a totally different way of looking at what's important in your economy and reframing it around quality of life amenities instead of a sort, sort of a race to the bottom to say who can cut taxes the most, who can pay their workers the least. Those uh, factors are still important to some businesses, but increasingly um, it's about quality of life. So uh, the, one of the toughest audiences to get to recognize this are economic development professionals like myself. And so a couple of years ago, we did a survey of every economic development professional in Pennsylvania, not, not every single one, but a lot of them. And 88% of my peers at Chambers of Commerce and at Economic Development Corporation said that fostering the outdoor economy was seen as very important in achieving their mission, which is a really great sign. It means that they recognize that quality of place, investment in parks, trails, open space uh, is part of their mission as an economic development professional. But almost none of them had taken any steps to act Activate that principle. So they hadn't incorporated an outdoor economy strategy into their strategic plan. They didn't systematically uh, help fund outdoor amenities or invest in outdoor infrastructure. And so although there's widespread recognition, there's a lot of opportunity in my community of economic professionals to do better and to embrace this paradigm shift uh, that we've been seeing. The final piece of this uh, paradigm shift in my mind is that investing in outdoor infrastructure is also a really important component of equity and having an equitable community. Um, 
this uh, I think has always been true. And the nice thing about most parks and open space are that they are free. And although there's barriers uh, through transportation and other uh, unseen barriers to participation in outdoor recreation, for the most part, these assets can be available if they're present. Uh, thanks to some really cool mapping from uh, PA DCNR and the Trust for Public Land and We Can Serve PA, we know where parks and trails are accessible over every inch of Pennsylvania. So they've done this mapping where you can look at your community, you can see how many people, and that includes a breakdown by kids, by seniors, by low income households, uh, high income households, how many of them have a 10 minute drive or a 10 minute walk, depending on which layer you click on, to a park or a trail. And so right away, the places that don't have access pop out to you very clearly. Um, and there's a lot of ways you can use a tool like that. One of them is to say, okay, well, these are the underserved areas and we're gonna direct our investment there. Um, but I think people are just starting to look at some of the equity aspects to um, outdoor recreation. And the importance of this to an economic development professional is that when you map uh, the places that have low access to outdoor recreation opportunities, which is what we're showing on the left, they match up very well with the areas that have persistent poverty, which is what I'm showing you on the right. And so if we do, if we believe that an investment in um, parks and recreational amenities uh, actually does provide economic opportunity and improves quality of life so people want to invest in an area and live in an area and you can retain your population, um, then this is a great way to uh, check both boxes, both address uh, underserved areas that have persistent poverty and help close some of these divides when it comes to access to outdoor recreation spaces. So I don't, and I'll apologize because I know many of you are from Lancaster, I don't have great numbers for Lancaster County, um, but I do have good numbers for York County because we just finished up a study that looked at our outdoor economy and we wanted to learn more about how many people are employed here, what the economic impact was. So in York County, more than 5,000 residents are employed in the outdoor economy. And remember that takes a bunch of different forms but that's a 14% increase in the last decade. Other sectors are shrinking. Um, healthcare is always rising. Manufacturing is always going down a little bit, but the outdoor economy is actually growing, which means it's this opportunity to help support a growing economic sector that it has more and more employment. And for uh, all of our constituents that are at, you know, active in real estate, that are in insurance and financial services, outdoor recreation employs more people than all three of those sectors combined. And if you think about the amount of attention that the real estate community gets, that our insurance community gets, our banks, um, rightfully so, they have an incredibly important part of our economy that they're responsible for, but they employ fewer people than outdoor recreation. So maybe there's an opportunity for some parity there when we're talking about our economy. And those stats do not include all the different businesses that show up elsewhere in our NAICS codes, which are the way that businesses are classified. And so the restaurant that's located along a trail that, you know, during the warm season has the outdoor dining and they're filled every day because people ride their bike and um, stop for a beer or a meal or the B&B that gets a lot of its, uh, its customers from a trail or uh, being close to a state park. Those aren't even counted there. So it's an undercount of how many people that are engaged. In York County, we're lucky to have uh, several state park units, including uh, the new one, the Susquehanna Riverlands, that the Lancaster Conservancy was uh, incredibly influential in securing. And you know, we don't have numbers on that state park, obviously, but the ones that are active, we host 2 million visits to our state parks every year. All of those are people that are buying uh, gas, groceries, uh, might be going out to eat, might be renting a boat, might be, um, I don't know, if it rains, maybe going over to the hotel and staying overnight. They're spending money while they're here. And so every year, our state parks alone generate $44 million in consumer spending and sustain 420 jobs. So that alone is a major economic contributor, especially to the rural parts of York County. 
In Lancaster, uh, Susquehanna State Park, obviously lower visitation, about 60,000 visitors a year. But even with that, and without a lot of amenities within the park that would force people to spend money, it's still generating $1.3 million in consumer spending. So even something as simple as a mostly passive recreation state park is an economic driver year after year after year. And I think we started to see a recognition of this from our uh, both of our counties, York County and Lancaster County commissioners, as they had to make choices about how they allocated CARES Act funding and ARPA funding, which were the two primary federal recovery programs that provided money to counties to help them recover from the pandemic. In York County, we invested about 1.4 million in conservation projects and organizations, um, including Susquehanna National Heritage Area, including um, the acquisition of open space, uh, trail building, and I know Lancaster County um, has allocated some funding for work that Lancaster Conservancy and the um, uh, and farmland preservation as well. So, you know, even locally, we're seeing these dynamics play out and they're really important, uh, but we also see a lot of opportunity. And one of the components of our study was to look at all the outdoor assets and cultural assets in York County. And so what you're seeing on the right is what we call an ecosystem map. It shows every one of those assets plotted. And then if you were to zoom in on this, which you can do on our website, you all those lines are color coded to show relationships between the different assets. So you might see on the arts and culture side, the Cultural Alliance of York County is a big node. And because they're a funder, they have lots of outreach into all these different um, art galleries, nonprofits, performing arts theaters. Uh, if you were to zoom in and see, um, uh, Sam Lewis, or not Sam Lewis, let's think of a county park, Rocky Ridge County Park in York County, you would see a node going back to the York County Parks Program. Uh, and so it helped us see which amenities are tied in well, which ones are sort of operating in a vacuum. And the interesting thing for us is when you look at the cultural sector, there's a lot of interconnectivity because for years there's sort of been um, allied arts campaigns, there's sort of state funding, local funding that forces collaboration. And so you see shared programming, shared funding sources, um, a lot of cooperation. On the outdoor sector side, it's very disparate. You might see a cluster of relationships, and I think that is York County Parks that you're seeing at the bottom left, but then you'll just see um, you know, a park, a local municipal park that stands alone, an outfitter that doesn't see itself as connected to the state park that's only five miles away. And so what this shows us is that despite the fact that we're employing a lot of people in York County, uh, there's a lot of work that can still be done to better knit the outdoor recreation sector together and see it grow even more if only all these different assets saw their interests as, as shared and we were articulating that better and supporting it better. And although uh, these are showing York County assets, I could almost guarantee you that if we were to map similar assets in Lancaster County, that same dynamic is at play. And if you zoomed out to all of Pennsylvania, it would be exactly the same because we just don't have a well-structured uh, support system for the outdoor sector. Um, but my last slide will show you uh, that we're working towards that. So what did we do with all this information? Well, in York County, we took all these insights and we put them directly into our economic action plan, which is a fancy word or fancy phrase for the chapter of our comprehensive plan that deals with economic development. And so this people focus place based approach that focuses in on outdoor infrastructure and parks and trails uh, nature based tourism nature based placemaking is actually part of our economic strategy in York County that our planning commission has signed off on our commissioners have unanimously supported and that's given us as a, the economic development organization the space to go out and try to activate some of these ideas that have come out of our uh, our studies and our work so to try to give you a sense for what this looks like in practice, I'm going to talk about the York County Trail Towns program, and then I'm going to talk about the Cadoris Greenway. Um, the reason I chose these two programs is that the Trail Towns program focuses on very small communities. The Cadoris Greenway is right in the heart of the city of York with 45,000 people. So I'm trying to show you that this works in small towns. It can also work in cities. So the York County Trail Towns program really is based on the fact that we have a 26 mile 
multi-use trail, the York Heritage Rail Trail that connects John Rudy Park, which is north of the city of York, uh, down through the city, through four small boroughs, and then down to the Maryland line where it picks up the NCR trail and continues down to the outskirts, outskirts of Baltimore, where there's another group of people that are trying to make that connection so that one day you'll be able to go from Baltimore to the city of York all on trail. So we have spent decades building this trail through our rail trail authority. And after 30 years, we had our golden spike moment this summer where we completed the last section in the city of York and it's done. So the trail has been in some of these communities that it passes through for decades, but there had been very little work to help activate it as an economic asset. Despite that, uh, it, we already know the Heritage Rail Trail has a significant economic impact. Um, it attracts, and again, I think this is an undercount, 260,000 people every year that use it. And on average, a daily trail user will spend $18. So that's their gas, their uh, cup of coffee, their beer, their lunch, their meal, um, you know, the bike that they bought at the beginning of the year and they went out 10 times. So dividing into the cost of that. And then sort of the golden standard is uh, overnight stays, the people that are staying in a B&B, staying in a hotel, because they're going to probably spend multiple days on the trail, they're going to buy more meals, and they're going to spend more money. So already, we knew that the trail had an impact. But when we looked back year after year at these economic studies, we also saw that consumer spending was trending down. So we knew that if we just didn't do anything, um, we could expect that trend to continue. And so we, we tried to reverse it through the Trail Towns program. We also knew that um, because of perception studies that we had done, that Black and uh, Latino communities considered the trail to be an unwelcoming place. And so we knew there's this whole group of people that would like to use the trail, might be inclined to do so, and just don't feel welcome there uh, because of the, the signage, the marketing, um, just the, the sense of, of security they have when they're on the trail. So there were a couple of things we wanted to achieve. Um, but the reason that the Economic Alliance was so interested in this is if you look at all of the businesses in York County and plot them uh, within proximity to the trail, 30% of our county's businesses and 17% of all jobs are really knit together by this 26 mile trail. So it is a corridor that could be used for recreation, for transportation, uh, to pull people off the trail and visit some of those businesses, to provide workers with a better quality of life, because if they're the place of employment is close to the trail, they can use it. Um, and it passed through some really cool communities that we wanted to leverage. So when we founded the program in 2020, uh, it began in the five communities along the Heritage Rail Trail. Um, York, Seven Valleys, Glen Rock, Railroad, and New Freedom. If you've ever been to Seven Valleys or a railroad in particular, you know these are very, very small communities. They have very few, um, or they have very little industrial base. And so the idea of creating a program that might lead to one or two new businesses opening and more people patronizing the businesses are there was a really big deal. And then in the second year of the program, we expanded to take in Wrightsville, which is really a hub of uh, outdoor recreation activity with the Northwest River Trail across the river, um, soon to be connected by the Memorial Bridge improvements, the Mason-Dixon Trail coming through town, the Susquehanna Greenway and the paddling happening on the river. Um, so Wrightsville um, is sort of at the hub of the intersection of a couple trails. And then Hanover, which is our second largest municipality in York County, and is on the front end of developing a trail between Hanover and Spring Grove. So we ran out and raised about $1.2 million and started on this process of investing in these communities, um, growing the number of trail-friendly businesses in each community that would welcome trail users, uh, extending the amount of time that people spent in each town so that they would visit more places, hopefully spend more money, and increase patronage for the businesses that were already located there. We also, because we're an economic development organization, worked really hard to align our Trail Towns program with our other strategic priorities. So we launched last year a program called the Bloom Business Empowerment Center, which is very focused on increasing the number of women-owned businesses in York County and businesses owned by people of color, because our data showed us that 
uh, both groups are underrepresented when it comes to entrepreneurship and business ownership. And so we have started making direct grants to businesses within these trail town communities. We've awarded $50,000 in grants to 24 businesses to help them expand their inventory, change their signage, add bike parking, um, add a refrigerator at the front of their business for grab and grow, go items or whatever improvements they wanted to make. And as, as part of that program, we've been able to support women-owned and BIPOC-owned businesses in uh, a lot of these communities. We also are linking this to our CDFI, which you know, without going into detail, it's a nonprofit bank that can do lending. And we'll now have the ability to also lend to businesses that either want to start or expand within our trail towns. So one of the benefits of being an economic development organization is we can make those investments directly in the businesses that want to embrace the trail. We've also found creative ways to make the trail important to people that don't even care about the trail at all. And one of those is that we uh, recognize that this trail, which is a county park, is a great corridor for broadband expansion. So when we received some federal money to expand our broadband network in York County, we pulled 16 miles of fiber underneath the rail trail, which is now serving as the backbone of a 144 mile broadband network that'll cover most of Southern York County um, and provide access not just to uh, every resident and business that wants it, which is our, our ambitious goal, but in particular, bring high-speed internet to these trail town communities along the trail. So not only are they benefiting from recreational use of the trail, tourism from the trail, but it's also going to bring them high-speed internet as well and improve quality of life that way. Um, and by owning this asset and using the trail in two different ways, both as a great recreational asset and as a corridor for internet, we saved about $5 million in engineering and construction costs and already owned the asset when we uh, installed fiber. So a win-win, and it helped get our county commissioners looking differently at our outdoor infrastructure. They've always been appreciative of it. They understand constituents want it, but this was a very pragmatic way to show that it could serve numerous needs. And of course, in Lancaster County, um, you could do exactly the same thing. And I think in some ways that conversation is already starting, um, particularly along the Northwest River Trail with a very, very high rates of visitation and use that we're seeing in Columbia and Marietta. Um, and I know those communities are already talking about ways they can work together to try to leverage that trail tourism and keep um, moving forward with the revitalization that all that visitation has brought. Uh, but the, uh, the Anole Low Grade Trail provides similar opportunities for Quarryville and the other communities along that trail. So uh, I talked a lot about the York County trails, but Lancaster has some trail towns that may not be designated that way, but are already delivering significant economic benefit um, for Lancaster County. So within our Trail Towns program, we've picked a couple projects to really focus on. I'm just going to show you one, and we call it Ruins Hall. Um, this is located in Glenrock, which is a um, which in the 19th century was uh, known for its furniture uh, manufacturing. So this is the Enterprise Furniture Company. On the right of the uh, photo, I don't know if you can see my cursor, is a warehouse. The big building in the middle is. Um, uh, the factory. And all that's left today are the remains of the brick building and then the skeleton of the warehouse on the right. The trail runs through the left side of this. This is, you know, all this is Glen Rock. This is the Heritage Rail Trail passing right through the heart of the town. And so when we looked at this space, which today is used for uh, public art and festivals and is sort of a li living graffiti space, uh, we thought that we could transform it. So we did a master site development plan uh, that would turn this into a truly accessible public plaza uh, with stormwater infrastructure, restrooms, ADA accessibility. This is what the site looks like today. Again, with the trail running towards the top of the photo, you can see sort of can't tell if this is public space or if it's open to the public or if you're even allowed to go there. And we want to make it this asset almost like a crown jewel along the Heritage Rail Trail and public plaza that can also support some small retail and draw people into Glen Rock so that they stay longer or draw people to Glen Rock so they can go out and uh, experience the rest of the trail. 
And uh, we've secured a million dollars in public funding for this and another million in private funding. So this is fully funded at $2 million. And we'll be moving forward with building this over the next couple of years. So the final project I wanna show you is the Cadoris Greenway. Um, if you're familiar with the Cadoris Greek, it runs right through the city of York, about a mile and a half, and it cuts through our downtown, but also um, our neighborhoods of the city. On the top left of this image is People's Bank Park, and which is our professional baseball stadium. And on the bottom right is your college's campus. And in between are a bunch of new development projects and uh, educational institutions and, um, and other assets that are linked a bit together by the Cadoris Greenway. About a hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago, uh, the uh, landscape architecture firm of Frederick Law Olmsted, the designer of uh, Central Park in New York City, came to York and said, the Cadoris can be your um, major promenade. It can be beautiful. Um, it can be, um, you know, sort of like the, the primary focus of your community. But he said it would cost a couple hundred thousand dollars. And at the time, they said that would be too much. And so today, this is what the Cadoris looks like. It's highly channelized. It has um, a dam. It's inaccessible to the community. And to fix all this for our project, it'll be about 75 million. So we could have saved a lot of money if we had just followed through on it back in the day. Um, so to give you the Cliff Notes version of the Cadoris Greenway, it's best just to show you uh, the before, which is what the Cadoris looks like today and the after in some of the renderings that will be um, hopefully the outcome of our project. You can see um, on the right an affordable housing development project right next to the creek, but you can also see the creek it has very steep slopes, uh, very little vegetation. It's slack water and warm because of the dam downstream. And we want to create uh, public access that will link this neighborhood and the affordable housing development project to the Cadoris, providing the first public access to our primary natural resource for the first time in a couple generations, uh, and link to all the great work that's happening um, on the Brown site that you can see, or Brownfield site that you can see at the top of the screen, which is a uh, new expansion to York College's campus. If you go downstream a little bit, again, this looks a little more aesthetically pleasing, and yet you still see there's no public access points down to the creek. Um, there's no vegetation, there's no riparian buffers. So we would um, you know, add a, quite a few acres of riparian buffers, public access points, and a trail that connects um, all along within the levee system. Um, and you can see it right on the bottom right of your screen. That's a switchback that comes up from the trail and links over to our rabbit transit facility uh, for public transit. And so we're trying to look at this from a, a multimodal and intermodal perspective, in part because uh, where this phase one of our project will take place is not only one of the poorest census tracts in the city of York, but one of the poorest census tracts in all of York County. So um, a number of our households in this project area are living in poverty. Um, they also, uh, about a third, don't have vehicles, their own personal vehicles. So these safe routes to school, um, intermodal opportunities are really important, plus just the dignity of having access to green space and recreation in your own community that's been cut off from the creek for so long is just really important. Um, as I said, it costs $75 million to build out all 1.4 miles of this project, but over time, um, a project like this is really important. It, it will have $190 million in benefit, primarily through safety benefits, but also through um, sediment reduction and nitrogen and phosphorus reduction through those riparian buffers. In fact, the whole Greenway project built out has the ability to reduce York County's overall sediment sediment uh, reduction goal by 16%. So not only is this a cool economic development and environmental justice project, but it also has significant environmental quality benefits uh, as well. So just to summarize, because I, I think I'm right at 45 minutes um, or 40 minutes, uh, what's next? I think there's a lot of great things happening at a local level um, in our two counties across Pennsylvania. And I think we're finally seeing some state um, focus on really promoting the outdoor economy and the synergy between economic development and recreation. Uh, last year, Pennsylvania hired its first ever director of outdoor recreation. 
uh, who then launched the Growing Outdoor Recreation in PA Task Force. Nathan, and Nathan Regner um, is leading that work. He's the first director. And the whole goal here is to really bring together all the different facets of the outdoor recreation uh, economy community, get their thoughts, get their support, and then hopefully launch our first statewide office of outdoor recreation, which would provide funding and coordination and technical assistance to communities and nonprofits that want to do more with this work. And ideally would bring people like myself and my economic development colleagues to the table so that we can incorporate the work of the office into the work that we do in our counties and our communities. Obviously, with the new administration coming in, we're hopeful that Governor Shapiro will work with DCD and DCNR and all the partners of this task force to better align economic development and outdoor recreation because we now have the data to show them that when they are applied together, they can bring uh, resilient economic development to communities and to Pennsylvania. And then I think regardless of what happens at a statewide level, communities taking this on on their own, um, like we're doing in York County, like you're starting to see in Lancaster County, um, like has been underway for a couple decades up in the Pennsylvania wilds or in the Laurel Highlands, um, that's going to be just as powerful as anything that happens on a state level. And the real um, core of that is that paradigm shift I talked about earlier, where outdoor recreation goes from being a nice to have to being seen as a really important economic sector that contributes to quality of life, helps you attract and retain businesses and people, contributes to public health, and does all the other great things that we know our parks and trails and open space do. So that's my final slide. And I think I'll uh, turn it back over to Keith to help facilitate any questions. Wow, uh, Silas, <laughs> that's, that's very impressive. You know, So as somebody that works for a land protection organization, I often don't think about the economic impact of our work, right? I'm in this for biodiversity conservation and for quality of life for our community, um, which apparently is, is part of the economic driver on this, right? So you know, we know that as humans, we need these beautiful green places for our own our own health, emotional, spirit, spiritual, physical, and that translates to quality of life, uh, and then clean air and clean water. $44 million of revenue due to the outdoor economy in York alone is incredibly impressive. Um, I've got a couple of questions along those lines. And so in terms of that, that really wide outdoor uh, economy sector, what kinds of ac outdoor activities are, are, have you seen that are growing the fastest in our region? Yeah, so one of the fastest um, is hiking, uh, and I think part of that is the barrier to entry and just the, um, I know you guys experienced that firsthand on your preserves and trying to manage that overwhelming interest and in use during the pandemic, but really across Pennsylvania, uh, hiking, particularly day hiking, has just seen astronomical growth. Um, the, the other uh, sort of exciting one is um, bicycling, cycling, but it's starting to take different forms. So like mountain biking uh, has always been popular, road cycling has been popular. Now uh, gravel uh, riding is, is growing in popularity. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about that is, um, you know, by its nature, it is on road, but it's sort of on the kinds of roads that we have and are underutilized. So state forest roads, state park roads, um, Michaud State Forest is sort of emerging as a huge destination for gravel riding. Um, and then there's things that you know, arguably are a little bit on the periphery of outdoor recreation, like RVing and boating, um, you know, things that require mechanized equipment, but at the end of the day are still about people getting outdoors. They're probably doing other outdoor activities as they're doing the motorized recreation. Um, so that how that in the same way that, you know, ATV use, snowmobile use has to be done in the right way so that you're stewarding natural places. Um, is still growing and credit to DCNR for some of the work they've been doing on managing the growth of motorized uh, use of trails and, and uh, public lands in trying to do um, some pilot projects in the last couple of years in Northern PA in particular to see how much use can you allow without it sort of impeding on other, uh, you know, traditional uh, recreational uses, but in particular hiking is the big one. Yeah, I've definitely seen some really creative solutions with DCNR in trying to accommodate, you know, ATVs and UTVs in outdoor spaces. And like, you know, the reuse of strip mines uh, is one of them that comes to mind. It's really genius, I think. 
Yeah. Um, and that is a way that people connect with the outdoors, whether I personally like that or not, doesn't really matter. I mean, that is another vehicle to get people connected to the places that we're working to protect. So it's pretty genius that they figured out how to accommodate that. Yeah. Um, and speaking of that connection and quality of life. And so in my mind, this is kind of, this sets us up for this tension, right? So we're protecting land um, and that's attracting more people to the region, which makes land protection more difficult or the land that's left to protect goes away. Yeah. Do you speak to that at all? Yeah, I mean, it's all, <laughs> yes, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, and, you know, same thing, not just with attracting people, but attracting businesses that, you know, need uh, land that's zoned correctly uh, so that they can develop their business. All of this has to happen in partnership with municipalities and counties and the planning that they're doing to manage that growth. Because, um, you know, the worst thing that can happen is you attract a bunch of people because you have a high quality of life. Then you have a bunch of growth and all of a sudden you lose that quality of life. Quality of life. <laughs> um, yeah. So it really is, it, it is really about, I think the communities that do it well are going to have the conservancies, the economic development corporations, the planning commissions, all sort of at the table, you know, making that balance happen in real time. I would say the problem with that now is that a lot of our planning is happens in silos. So, for example, a traditional comp plan of a county is going to have a transportation chapter, a housing chapter, uh, economic development chapter, a natural, you know, greenways and trails and parks and open space plan. And they don't really talk to each other. So part of that paradigm shift isn't just getting economic development people to see the value of the outdoors and outdoor people to see that they have an economic contribution, it's to start to break down some of those silos and build our capacity to do better planning so we can prevent that kind of that kind of you know imbalance from happening and lose the things we care about. Yeah, and I think you know conversations like this and the uh, the summit that you presented, I think are a good start to that that process. And you know my bias, but I think you know so far in this region, it feels like that balance has been struck um, for the most part. And, um, you know, the, seeing these trail town, towns emerge and that trail town economy, both on New York and the Lancaster County side of the river, is just phenomenal uh, and very encouraging. Yeah. Um, related, I think, oh, go ahead. And Keith, just I think on both sides of the river, when it comes to those small towns, um, you know, there are situations, I think, where where a desire to live somewhere and start a business somewhere you don't, they don't need any, you know, the market's going to take care of itself in some way. So why yeah. add gas to a fire? And that's when yeah, I right. think start to see open space being eaten up or, yeah. you know, all the available space along a road is now commercial or, you know, industrial. In the communities where, uh, like trail town communities, there is no industrial base. Um, you know, these are communities that have seen generations of population loss, disinvestment. And so they are precisely places mm -hmm. that need bit of a catalyst and that I think the the downside is much more minimal than if you were out promoting it in an area where there's already rapid economic growth. Um, and that's why a group like ours, the Economic Alliance, loves this program because it allows you to get into small communities that you haven't been able to provide a value to in, in the past and show them that the assets they already have actually can be leveraged, you know, to provide value. So we, yeah, we love it. scalable. Yeah, and that, that Ruins Hall example of that exactly is, I think, just stellar, you know. I had a, a good question here. So do you see land acquisition outside the city in three municipalities working together as a possible funding source? Um, I might need you to say that again. So it's it, outside yeah. the city, three municipalities right. three, working Three municipalities together. outside the city um, as possible funding. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I think um, that might I think that might be as a possible uh, uh, funding recipient. If three oh, municipalities okay. partner together, working outside of York City, would they qual Would they be a, a project that would qualify yeah. for funding? Yeah, I think yeah. I think they would. Um, the way that we've tried to structure our program is that uh, you know we have communities where we're really focused and we're sort of going a couple levels deep, and we have strategic plans and we have action teams working. And, but everything that we're creating, like all the educational resources, our trail-friendly business program, that is open to anybody in the county that can check a couple boxes. So like if you're a community that might have like a mile of trail and it's not really a tourism destination, but you really want to embrace the assets that you do have and you might have one business that's your, your ice cream shop that really benefits from that trail connection or your really popular community park, 
there's still the same, the same principles still apply. You can still do this on a different scale. You don't even need our help to do it. You just have to be committed to it as a community. But I do think the communities that can work together and then go to state agencies and say, we have a plan and maybe add into your traditional application that just says, we want to preserve, you know, 30 acres of, of open space, you know, that there is this quality of life benefit, that there's going to be businesses that benefit from it. If you can identify those things, um, I think it just makes it that much more powerful, especially if yeah. you're working between municipalities. Yeah, so I've got two, two related uh, statement and a question. So uh, one is about Maryland working with Pennsylvania to extend the trail into, into Maryland. And actually, the one before that is a comment about your slide shows the Rail Trail Cafe in New Freedom, which is now closed, but we can add Alecraft Brewing uh, in Railroad yes. as a new business. And so to answer the second question, years ago, I, I biked with my son starting in Moncton, Maryland on the NCR Trail up through New Freedom uh, when the York Ra uh, Heritage Rail Trail was just starting. Um, and so he's he's out of college a couple of years and teaching high school now. And he was a little dude, maybe seven years old. So to answer that question, there is an uh, interconnection between the NCR Trail in Maryland that grades right into the York Heritage Rail Trail once we cross that state line. And it's great to see that. Sad to see that New Freedom Cafe isn't there. We stopped and ate at that place, in fact. Um, but it's great to see a new business opening up in its place. Yep. And in the uh, place where the New Freedom Cafe is, is the Northern Central Railway, which now has a bike shuttle train on it. Oh, and how the, cool. Um, yeah, uh, does uh, the bike, you know, the bikes that go on the rails themselves. So, yeah, right. Yeah. That's and three, and if you haven't been in, anybody hasn't been in New Freedom in a while, there's three new breweries in New Freedom, tiny little New Freedom PA. So yeah. go have a beer. That's so cool, Freedom. man. Love those little, those little railroad towns and how they're being revitalized by both the combination of the NCR and then grading into the York, York Rail Heritage Trail. Yeah. So cool. And so exciting to see York potentially get linked with Baltimore via yes. that trail system. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's this, there's this whole regional, you know, beyond just that connection, there's this concept of the Grand History Trail that will eventually link York uh, through Baltimore to DC, wow. back up to Frederick, back to yeah. Gettysburg, over to Hanover, <laughs> back to York. So it's this big regional plan. Um, and we're actually going to be doing some work this year on bringing those different partners together, to see, you know, it's, how realistic it really is. We've been talking about it for 20 years, but it would be really awesome to see that kind of vision happen. Yeah. Well, Silas, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and all the work that you're doing to make this become a reality in our region. This is so exciting, you know, from somebody who's working to protect land and seeing uh, another way to get people engaged in that work through, you know, the economic development end of that. that. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's excellent. Just a reminder, folks, on February 22nd, we have our next nature hour. That's going to be State of Our Rivers with our lower Susquehanna Riverkeeper, Ted Evgenitis and Jeremy Monroe, who is a uh, uh, filmmaker making uh, underwater uh, uh, documentaries across North America. So that'll be a really great conversation from, from two different ge geographic perspectives. Once again, thanks to our corporate sponsors, Clark Associates, Staffers of Kissel Hill, Dart, Electron Energy, Eurofins like Schwama, Penstone, or two. None of this would be possible without them. Thanks, everybody. Thank you again, Silas. Good night.